Hi, my name is Christian Rieben. I am a painter, and I am going to show you how I sometimes start a painting by using a pour. What is a pour? A pour is literally pouring paint onto a canvas and letting that kind of get the ball rolling in terms of imagery, forms, etc. Um, but to do so, we got to change the nature of the paint. And the paint comes out of the tube, it's not quite liquid enough to pour. So, this is how you make it a little more liquid. So, um, I like to start with three colors that I think are going to go well together. Uh, none of this is set in stone. You can change things down the line, um, which is the best way to make a painting anyway. So in this case, what I've got is a cadmium green, a cerulean, and a brown that I've mixed up from some green and some orange with a little titanium uh, to pick up the value. You probably want to start out with about um, maybe a Chicken McNugget size of each lump of paint. Uh, when you've got the amount of paint that you want, you're gonna stick them into a can and um, mix with your medium and your paint thinner. I use Galkid as my medium and uh, my paint thinner, well, I use different sorts of paint thinners. In this case, I'm gonna use a Gamsol. So I am scooping up my gorgeous brown pouring in some calcin pouring in some gamsol now I said I, I'm using gamsol um, but I've done this with all kinds of paint thinners so it really it, it doesn't make a difference as far as I can tell. I'm also going to use a clean-ish brush um, to mix the paint with the medium and the solvent. Do, do, do. And that is definitely on the thin side but that's actually fine for what I want this color to do in the pour. Um, the cerulean, I'm going to make a little thicker. So plop it in there. So probably the same amount of Galkid as I did, um, and just less of the paint thinner. So in terms of consistency, um, can you see that, how that drips off of there? So it's dripping like, it's maybe just slightly more liquid than melted ice cream. Um, definitely thicker though than my brown. You can hopefully tell. And uh, let's see, the cadmium green, I'm gonna do probably halfway between those two. sort of overkill on the size of these cans, but that's what I had. Um, I've even used like little tuna cans before. You don't really need gigantic cans for this, unless your canvas is gigantic. It's quite likely too, just as a heads up, that we will be adding more paint, or we might be adding more paint at some point um, in this whole pour process. All of that will become clear once we start. Okay, um, I'm working on a canvas that is 42, 44 inches square. Uh, let's just start. I don't really have a plan. Um, I'll start off with our brown. Brown is traditionally a problem color for me. I don't know why. Um, I just don't connect with it like I do some other colors. 
<laughs> All right. Da, 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 da. All right. I can already tell we're going to have issues, but that's fine. So, uh, one of the issues is I have not mixed enough paint for the size of this canvas. Um, so, I am going to, uh, I'm actually just going to splash some, some uh, paint thinner on this and break the, the preciousness, let's call it, of the, the white surface here. So what this, this is going to do is um, start to work this whole surface so I'm not so concerned with individual shapes that I've got going on and I'm more concerned with how to... <sighs> Alright, I um, had some technical difficulties with the recording. So annoying, but whatever, that's the nature of this. Um, so while that was screwing up... Uh, what I did was uh, pour the turquoise, wasn't really happy with how it was looking. I went and mixed up some uh, a darker brown and then just some white and put them in. And I'm much more interested in how this is looking. I'm getting several different textures going on in here uh, that are intriguing to me, that are very suggestive to me. Uh, the white in particular is adding uh, a variety of value and saturation, which, I, which I'm responding to. So um, we will have to let this sit now. And again, this is literally a fluid situation. So when we look at it again, things will be different than they are right now. And that's kind of just something you have to accept when you're working with something like pores. Uh, but there's a, a fun surprise element. When you come back, you know, tomorrow or the next day and see how the colors have settled in. Uh, sometimes you're into what happens, sometimes you're not into what happened. But regardless, that's, that's part of the nature of the process. So we'll stop this now and I'll show you this other painting, uh, this canvas that I started a couple days ago that needs an intervention. So over here... Um, I've got a canvas that I started a couple days ago, um, and this is so. This is where we come in and we we see what's happened while it's dried. The shape of this has changed a lot since I poured it. Um, you know, as these colors uh, combine and and meet each other as they're moving around the canvas, sometimes they'll make a little wall that then breaks, and that's what happened here when I left. Um, this purple kind of ended right there, and now it's gone off up there and, and done something else. Um, let me show you one little technique you can do. Um, I don't love uh, the, the color that happened up in this section here. Um, it's a little muddy. Uh, things are, you know, things are. So Still, at the driest they are, um, they're tacky. And I can tell up here that there's a lot that's not dry at all. So I'm going to blot it. And sometimes when you blot, interesting little things can happen in terms of pattern um, and how the colors are kind of layered. So for me, that is more interesting than it was, just as a shape. Um, but I'm still overall, um, let's say dissatisfied with, uh, with where things are. I won't say, I won't even say dissatisfied. Um, it's, it's, we're at an early stage, so you wouldn't be satisfied anyway. There are things that I like in here. Um, I like, I, li I like the overall color combination. I like how some of these, um, ribbons of colors have, um, been created, but, um, I, and I, I know that the painting needs a little bit more what I was talking about on the other one, needs sort of an overall uh, relationship between the colors, the forms, and the, the square that all of this is taking part on. So I am going to um, do a pour on top of this pour 
I am going to, um, what am I going to do for color? I'm, I'm going to work with the colors I've had, I have. I'm, I'm not obliterating them. Um, I might use some of the same and then I might um, somewhat adapt something to make it work. Okay, I have um, mixed a few colors to put down on this guy. I, I'm using the Azo yellow that was in this one, but I've added a little white to it to, um, to maybe desaturate it. Um, I have some Payne's gray and some dioxazine purple, and that is really just to bring in um, some darkness. I, I felt it was uh, a little too um, overall cheery. So one thing I'm also gonna do, um, the, both of the canvases that I'm working on here have pretty prominent um, center braces, and that is lifting the middle of the canvas off so the painting is the paint itself is sliding away from the middle of it. Oftentimes, if you don't have a cross brace, um, the opposite will happen where the paint sort of collects in the middle. One thing you can do to offset both of those situations is to just put a little bit of uh, something rag in this case under um, sections of the canvas, and that just um, it, it keeps you from kind of coming up with the same. Uh, composition over and over again. So we're gonna pour, let's see, this is the Payne's Gray. I'm gonna um, put some of this over there and maybe over on this side. I'm gonna, I think, stop talking because <laughs> it's hard for me to talk and um, think at the same time. Bit of a bit of a disability. So, uh, you can just watch and I'll flail around. I am going to um, put a little more uh, paint thinner on these blobs to get them to loosen up a little bit. And this is just sort of my taste too. Like you might, um, you might like having thick blobs uh, that don't um, interact much with other layers. It's just, I don't. So uh, for me also right now, this is getting better because it's complicating the space uh, a little bit more, um, which is a good thing as far as I'm concerned. When we come back, after I've let uh, this guy dry a bit and, and the other one, and when I actually start painting on these surfaces, then you'll see why maybe I want something that's a little more complicated than so straightforward. But I'm not, I'm not quite done here yet. I'm kind of seeing where things are, are traveling and how the color interacts. That's kind of just fun too. It's just, I think, satisfying looking at color, um, especially color and movement. It's pretty exciting.
So I'm going to see if I can show you up close a little more of some of the cool stuff that's going on. Um, hopefully <laughs> camera is somewhat aimed at this. Um, so it has been mesmerizing watching this. Now, again, like I said earlier, things change when it dries. So I'm going to cut the video now, and then in a couple days, we'll come back in and see what has happened. Hey, so it is over a week since we've done our pour. Now our canvases are ready to work on. Something to keep in mind when you're doing a pour is it can vary as to how long it takes the paint to dry uh, for you to get to the next stage. Depending on how thick the paint is, um, and that means like how much medium you added to it uh, versus paint thinner. But also the situation, uh, the environmental situation that you're painting in. So I'm painting in a cold basement studio. It is freaking cold in here. And that means paint takes longer to dry. So in this case, it's taken over a week for these canvases to be ready. But now they're ready. First one we're going to be working on is um, this guy right here. I actually thought this one um, was going to be easier to start than it is. So one of the reasons that we do a pour, besides just the interesting phenomena that happen through the materials, is we are relinquishing some control. So the paint just goes and we can manipulate a little bit the direction that things tilt in or whatever. But there are things beyond our control, and that is good, that is a positive. So what happens then is that we start to see uh, forms that are suggestive of other things. Um, and in this case, the things that I'm seeing are not really things that I'm super attached to. So I can kind of see here, I mean, one thing I really like is I like this sort of almost Art Nouveau form that's going on right here. It's very elegant, um, biomorphic, um, and, I, and I'm enjoying all the colors. The things, though, that I'm seeing that are representational, that I'm not super into, although someone else might be into them, but I'm just not into them, I'm seeing some figures here. So I'm seeing, there's sort of like a male figure, uh, head, beard, long hair here, a really long arm, arched back, leg coming up, going down to some weird club foot. If we, uh, let me show you. If I turn it this way, it actually then looks more like a, uh, a figure that is <laughs> kind of examining their foot. So foot, leg, arm coming down, upper body, arching the back. Um, either way, I'm not super excited by those um, just because eh, that's not really what I'm interested in. So what I'm going to do here is... Um, I'm going to work productively. I'm going to put down a ground on top of everything I've got here and I'm going to wipe away and start to see what happens from that point. There will be no talking while I do this. I should say, however, that I have mixed up a very dark ground, something to kind of match the darks that I've already got going on here. So uh, one thing that I um, should have mentioned to you <laughs> when I was starting this is um, the paint I'm putting down as a ground, one, is quite thin, and two, I'm not putting it down super hard. I'm not um, totally concerned with completely uh, obliterating whatever I've got under here 
Um, so if I want to leave something open to kind of remind me of where some bits are, that's a, that's fine. Um, and I don't want to press too hard either because some of these patches that have thicker bits of the pour on them, they're not going to be completely um, dry. So it'd be pretty easy for me to press too hard on something and to break that skin. And then, then we have a bit of a mess. So I'm trying not to do that. Um, another point that is, uh, I should have elaborated on a little bit, is why do I want to relinquish control? Um, because the problem is our brains are wired in such a way that um, they, they solve problems. And one way to solve a problem is through just cliches so that uh, your brain has a problem. The problem is, what do I paint? What do I put down here? And so you start to do things and the things that you start to do are actually relatively limited um, consciously. Your brain just sort of has this these parameters as to what it goes to for solutions. And that ends up being boring. That ends up being just sort of the usual subject matter presented in the usual sort of way. So by relinquishing control, by letting things go in a way that um, is beyond my conscious deliberate manner of doing it, it's gonna take me into some things that I don't automatically go to when I, when I think of things or when I look at things. And thus, um, maybe things are presented in a little bit more of a fresh, interesting, intriguing way. Anyhow, so um, I got my ground down and I am going to get some rags together and I'm going to start wiping away. And when I start wiping away, I'm not, um, again, I'm not really consciously thinking. I'm just going to start making some marks and I'm going to try to, the best of my abilities, lose myself within what it is that I'm doing. So I'm not planning on doing anything. I'm just responding to what my eyes are seeing there. So I did a little more work um, on this guy 
uh, after this morning, I brought in some more of the yellow that was in there initially and sort of built up um, bits of uh, a, a yellow form that I saw under there. It's somewhat body-ish to me. Um, and there's some other interesting things going on. Uh, there's kind of a weird, I don't know, baby head monkey thing up here. And something else maybe um, body, body related right there. And then this, um, I don't know, stick, and it looks like there might be a, a head on a stick. I don't know what it is, but I uh, I am interested in um, in what it has started here. So it's given me a path forward. Uh, I will let this <clears throat> dry before I come in at the next stage. Um, yeah, and that's it. So I, I'm feeling good about where this where this is at this point. So our next. Um, painting we will start uh, in a different sort of way than this one. So this is our other canvas. Um, totally different situation than the previous canvas. This one I actually see something that I am interested in um, which presents a different sort of problem in that I want to hold on to something. Um, at the same time, though, not letting what I am attracted to in the painting stop me from developing the painting as a whole. So what I see, and I don't know if you can tell from um, back where you are, but also just because it is kind of ambiguous at this point, um, there's sort of a bird human figure here. This is their head, eye socket, beak, uh, maybe an arm coming down to sort of a hand um and maybe there's a hint of the other hand over on that side so um so i like that so i'm going to try to keep that however a lot of other stuff has to happen here and i guess at this point i'm thinking maybe establish more of a sense of the space that this is happening in and that's what i'm going to be working on right now
So, um, I'm gonna let that sit for a while. Um, I was flailing there for a bit. Not, maybe not flailing as much as um, just noodling about, kind of waiting for serendipity. And uh, I'm interested now in this uh, landscape that's going on. It's a, it's a um, color scheme, which is different than my like, automatic color scheme. And that's good because we all fall in the traps with that. Uh, so I'm gonna let it and um, get back to it when it is dry. Uh, this one, we have got the space built up a little bit more. Um, we've got maybe a bit of a narrative going on. Uh, it got a particular palette going on. The In terms of the pour, uh, what is being held on to here is uh, a, a lot of the forms that went down and let me pull this over here some of the textures that are going on so we've got this weird little baby critter and um, some of the the pigments that separated during the pour process are giving it an interesting texture and then likewise um, in this thing here which is probably going to end up being some sort of head on a stick so our second painting here uh, the pour has given us some really nice texture and, and form, and what that's done then is given us a character to build the painting around. So he's this um, strange bird man. Um, I'm really digging this whole uh, section in here and just the, the diversity and the, the nuance of what the paint is giving us in terms of texture. Uh, he's probably ultimately going to be pooping out an egg and um, I'll, I'll build up the space a little bit more. But those are all issues not um, related to the pour itself. That's just general uh, painting going on there. Now, neither of these paintings are going to be finished by the time your course is over. I'll, I'll post them on my website and Instagram um, when they're done. But in the meantime, I'm gonna show you a few other paintings that are completed and how that initial pour sits in a finished painting. Ah, this painting is um, it's a bunch of weird flowerish creatures that are uh, reaching towards the moon there. You can see that the, that initial pour really kind of gave the whole thrust to the painting. So we've got this um, form up there. We've got this form right there. Both of those um, are giving us really nice textures, but also giving us really interesting organic forms. Uh, likewise, in this painting, um, the textures, uh, not so much. In this case, it's really more the forms. Are, uh, have been determined by that initial pour. So we've got this kind of blobby thing going on up there, and then the pour down here, both of those establishing the overall uh, composition of the painting just through the character of the pour itself. And then, <laughs> and then finally, this painting, um, whose pour influenced how this thing ended up. We've got this kind of abject uh, royal character deteriorating um, out in the woods somewhere. So uh, this one, the pour gave us some really interesting textures down in through this whole interior, uh, which became this cavity. And then this vaguely heart-like organ happening there. Uh, it just gave me some pathways to pursue in the construction of the painting, and that's one of the whole objectives of this little lesson we got going on here. I hope that this has been uh, instructive and helpful for you in your own pathway as a painter. Um, Till next time.